Greetings, dear friends. Welcome once again to Church in the Home. This is our opportunity to get together with you and with people all around the world who are hearing the Christ Life message, many of them through this very broadcast of Church in the Home. We're so thankful that the Lord has put in our hands an opportunity to reach you with the message that is making the difference in people's lives. It's the message of the liberating secret, a secret which religion has not been interested in. And God has kept it covered until he had a people to whom he could reveal these marvelous truths. When the Apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus, he had a good friend named Ananias. And Ananias said uh, some wonderful things to Paul, told him that he would be used of God before kings and uh, even the children of Israel. He would be a used tool in God's hand, and God would show him the many things which he must do suffer for his name's sake. When I think of that, I'm thinking of you and I who gather together in this meeting today. You know what? We are a part of that vision that God gave to the Apostle Paul. We're an intricate part of what God gave to him. Because God said there'd be many people that would be blessed from kings down to the children of Israel, that includes us somewhere in there, who would be blessed also. We are blessed because we have been able to carry on by God's grace the message which was given to the Apostle Paul. We're so glad that you're part of it. Robbie's here with me today, and, and I always want her to say a word, and we're just, we're just blessed to be able to be where you are right now. So, Robbie, what do you have to share? Well, it's good to be back today. Uh, we're kind of getting our lives put back together again after our summer's adventures with uh, uh, unexpected happenings, but uh, we've kind of got it behind us now, right. don't well, we? we got a new baby out of it. <laughs> He's... He's doing quite well, and uh, I've, ha I've got my hairdresser back now. She's <laughs> back on her feet, I'm happy about that. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about the scripture. I woke up in, this morning thinking about a term, a term that uh, I'm sure I learned probably when I was a child uh, memorizing scriptures, but this term just kind of bounced around in my head, so I, I looked it up, and I'm going to share it. Uh, it's in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And the 11th verse, it says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And I took, I took note that it didn't say the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It said the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And I was th thinking about the chastening that comes from the Father. Um, we, we, we kind of think chastening is when we've done something bad and we get punished for it or scolded or something. But um, I just thought about the, the, the circumstances and situations we refer to, we refer to as uh, the CNS gang. It's, it's built into the universe. Um, and it's, it's those circumstances and situations that really become our um, our um, chastening, right. <laughs> yes. not yes. necessarily because we've done something, uh, we've sinned or done something bad. It's just, um, uh, and it said it yieldeth, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised thereof or thereby. So I was, um, it's really easy to be drawn into the circumstances and situations, and and. Um, they they get our focus and our attention and our emotions, and um, and really can rob us of a lot of, of right. important time, right. um, especially with you know we trying to um, get this message out by every means. We've got these five or six books we're trying to get into print right now, and the things that Father would have us to do, and it's easy to become distracted. Uh, by the issues of life, the circumstances and situations, or as I read in the scriptures, the chastening of the Lord. And um, rather than to just um, go through them, allowing the peaceable fruit of righteousness to, to operate right. on a daily basis, even, even when you're being chastened. <laughs> so um, I, that's just really my desire today and my prayer is that um, that we not be sidetracked or, or get our focus and attention off on things that um, take, our, take um, 
our energy as yeah. well as our time right. and um, allow us to press forward with the, with the message. We received some wonderful letters this week from people on the live broadcast, 365. Right. Just really thrilled mm -hmm. us That's both. That's a computer radio. Yeah, that just really thrilled us both. Uh, people we've never met, people we've never heard from before. Uh, one gentleman in Canada, and I can't remember where several of the other, others are, but uh, excited about what they're hearing on the broadcast, your right. messages. And many of our people in the Christ Life Fellowship do not even turn that broadcast on. And yet, these that we heard from just can't believe what they're hearing. Right. They're excited. And I just really hope we don't become uh, so, so nonchalant with what the Father has given us that we just don't take for granted that we lose the excitement that we had at one time right. with what the Holy Spirit has brought to us. Can you imagine this small body of people being given the revelation of Christ in us to share with the world and then we start taking it for granted and lose the excitement right. and, the, and the awesomeness of it. That would and be I shameful. Just, I just don't want that to happen, not in my life and our lives, but in the lives of those that we come into contact with. So let us encourage you to not to be, become so wrapped up in, in your issues and, and uh, you lose what the Father is really doing in your life and in the lives of those around you. You are Christ in your form where you are. You are the salt. You are his expression where you are. And I think if, if there's a trick of the enemy, it would be to cause us to lose that right. and start taking never, it for granted never, and never. nonchalant. So we love you and we're so glad you joined us today. Right, you want to remember our 365 radio broadcast. It's on your computer. Every computer in the world has access to this message. All you got to do is go to our web page and press the buttons and you'll get it. So glad you're tuned in today because I got a message that I believe will stir your heart. It's a message on grace, so let's hear it now. Now, if you will, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to be talking to you concerning grace. Pure and simple grace. This has become one of the biggest words in my vocabulary because the grace of God is unfolded more to me every day in a new and a fresh way. Pure grace is hard to find. You can read your Bible for centuries if you could live that long and never run into pure grace unless you concentrate it on Paul's message. It is Paul who introduces us first to pure grace, what it is and how it is to function and operate. Actually, grace is a very simple thing, but religion has made it a very odd, weird far out, different thing. But we're happy to report that there is a new movement in the world today that may not have been here since Paul's day to such an end. Because today, pure and simple grace is being exhorted, preached, and dealt with as never before. Many of the strongest voices in Christianity are being raised for grace and what it stands for. Heretofore, most of our great Christian leaders were not out and out for grace. They were just not so centered in grace being all. Mainly because they're not centered in Paul's message. They don't understand and know what it is Paul is saying, what he's doing. And if you don't know what Paul is doing, if you don't understand what Paul is saying, you're never going to come to grace. Because grace... <coughs> excuse me. Grace is the very heart and center of his message. So there's a new movement coming about in the world today. <coughs> it's a new movement inside of Christianity. 
It has long been the basis and the heart of Christianity. But it's moving today as we've never seen and known it before. It's a movement of freedom. It's an abrupt change from religion and what it had to offer. Because religion is basically a power, even when it's scriptural, the power is to bind people, to hold people, to cause people to become something according to whoever it is that's doing the teaching and the preaching. <coughs> so it's a movement of freedom. We are really loosed to be free, to grow up in freedom, and to come to the fullness of what is ours in Christ Jesus. More and more believers are recognizing the power of freedom today because never before have I seen man-made restrictions and legalism and regulations as I see in religion today. Mo <coughs> Excuse me, I've had a, a bit of a cold and I'm having trouble getting rid of the frogs. <coughs> more and more, religion has put restrictions and legalism and human regulations on people because it has become more of a competitive thing than it has ever been before. Religion has become very competitive. Here in the city of Dallas, where I am, there's a church almost on every corner. And every church is bidding for and bargaining for somebody to come to the church. And those that have the more powerful churches can't operate without people. They got to have people because there's great expense. There's great power in the people gathering together. And so regulations have been put on people. Some people have to sign a pledge that they give so much money to the Lord. Some people have to make a contract with the Lord in order to be faithful to where they worship. Some people have to make a covenant to the Lord. They have to do all sort of things because grace is still far out in the distance. To understand grace and to know that God can operate without any of the machinery, any of the tools, any of the religious technology that is so abounding today, he has operated from the beginning without it and can still do it. <coughs> and so people are coming to this understanding. They're coming to see just what there is in the Lord. The God of grace is moving today as I've never known him in my many years of preaching. And so I can't continue on without talking about grace every once in a while because most of the people that I talk to are people who have been in the law. They have been a part of the law. They have uh, worshipped at the shrine of the law. They have heard nothing but law preaching most of their life. And so deep within every Christian that has been raised in religion, and by religion I mean that place that you go to where you have to do something to prove yourself to the Lord. That's religion. Religion is somebody that has to operate under some sort of a law in order to be pleasing to God. But sooner or later, people who go on with the Lord break from this. And as they break from this, they come to a place to where the God of grace becomes most important, most thrilling to them. I must say, no one can go on to the fullness of Christ under a law, anybody's law, law in any way, form, shape, or whatever. And so just as the people of the world are coming to know who they are in Christ, they are equally accepting the grace of God. The grace of God. Grace. What is grace? Grace is simply you can do nothing within yourself to please God. You understand that? You can do nothing within yourself.
it's the hardest life they ever lived. And at first I wondered about that. I didn't understand what they really meant. But as I look back now and remember other things that were said, among those that we gave an answer to was that it is hard to live in grace. It is much harder to live in grace than it is to live under the law. Because under the law, you can and you must do something to please God. In grace, you can do absolutely nothing to please God. What is the difference there? The difference is a birthing. Those that have been birthed and are family members and know exactly who and what they are in Christ do not have to be told to serve God. Don't have to be told to be faithful. Don't have to be told that they're obligated in some way. They're in the family. They have the family spirit. They have the very uh, dimension of, of God's love that He intended that every one of His offsprings have. More so, they have this unyielding desire to love the Father and do nothing except out of law. Now, every believer that has been raised under the law, I believe, have what we call a deep root of the law. The deep root of the law is that thing that has taken hold of you at some time and place in the past to where you come to the idea that if, if I don't do something or if I don't please God, he's going to cause judgment to come on me. He's going to cause a hard lie. But the facts are, since you can do nothing to be pleasing unto God within yourself, because you're his birth offspring, he loves you and cares for you more than you could ever get by doing something for him. The end result is that you need to move on. You need to move on into the grace that is yours in Christ Jesus. That grace is something that's yours the moment you're saved, regardless of how you started out in the Lord. Even if you started out under law, that grace is still available to you because God withholds nothing from anybody whom he has birthed. Being born again, being saved by grace, withholds nothing from you that God has. He gives all to you as he would to any child. Well, a lot of people think, yeah, if I got everything from God that I ought to have, then why don't I have his, his uh, powers? Why don't I have his abilities? Why don't I have his Godship operating through me? Well, the answer to that is very simple. A father who births three or four sons of his gives those sons life, gives them opportunity, but those sons never become who he is. You understand that? A daughter that is birthed never becomes who the mother is. She can take on their ways. She can take on their attitudes. She can take on their abilities. But she can never become them. And so when you were born again, you took on the very God nature. That's what you get in the birthing. Peter says, in his epistle, we are partakers of God's nature. Think of that. The very nature of God. Well, what's in the nature of God? The nature of God is that which is motivated by his grace. His nature and his grace are inseparable. Grace producing the nature of God. It's in our birthing. It's in our salvation. And so... Even though we have this very liable and powerful ministry of the Lord given to us by His grace, the grace killers are still around. There will always be more grace killers than there are grace livers. livers. The grace killers are abundant because they have never discovered the grace of God in being able to supply all things according to His riches and glory. 
And probably one of the greatest reasons why the grace killers will not come on into the full grace of God, though all of them use parts of the grace of God, sounds better if they do, but the reason they can't come into the full grace of God is that they have never learned to trust God as a father. Until God becomes an innate father to you, one who bursts you, one who's in charge of you, one who cares for you. I don't mean in a religious sense. I don't mean picking up somebody's devotional book and say, oh, isn't that wonderful? The Lord loves me. I mean you have had a revelation of Christ in you so that you never see God again as somebody far out. You see him directly as your father. You see in your life a manifestation of his seed, which is Jesus Christ. And the grace of God becomes simple when that happens. The grace killers are set to keep people from this by telling people, well, if you don't do what we tell you to do, you'll not be a good Christian. And they bring out all the scriptures, usually scriptures under the law. Even words of Jesus, for he spoke under the law. But they can never go to Paul's epistles and bring you law. For Paul will say, I think it's 23 times in the epistle to the Galatians alone, he said the law is stopped, it's over, it's been dispersed, it's been uh, killed out at the cross. He's got all kinds of words to say it in different ways, but he says it again and again, the law is dead. It doesn't work with God anymore. It's not in operation anymore with God. And so people who continue in the law have ulterior motives in the use of the law. You can always catch somebody that's in a backslidden state and put a little law on them and they'll do something for God real big. Real big. I've seen that happen lots of times. I've seen an old backslidden boy come in the back door of my church at times and I thought, boy, I hope the law really lays it on, Lord really lays it on him because he's wanting to get back and he's willing to pay a price. Sure enough, his offering is bigger. His words are kinder. All because he's still under the law. On the other hand, I had a young man <clears throat> in California who was addicted to drugs. It looked like time and again he was getting off of drugs. And so... He went through a long period where he had no drugs and I just I placated him, placed him, <coughs> put him in places where he could feel like he was really one of us. But then he dropped out. I knew he was back under drugs again. He had a fight with a demon that was within him. But one day I looked and here he came into the building. He had come back. He come up to me sheepishly and he said, lay it on me. Sock it to me. Say whatever you're going to say. I'm ready for it. I grabbed him around his shoulders and hugged him and said, best thing I can say to you is, I love you and God loves you. He pushed away and he said, is that all you're going to say? I said, that's it. That's it. What is it? Grace could receive him, but the law that was in him couldn't allow him to be received. That's the difference between them. One, he wanted to have something to happen to him badly so that he'd straighten out. The other was he had no sense that God loved him as much or more when he was in trouble than at any other time. Law and grace are the opposites in God's plan. And yet, most of the Bible is a law book. As I've said many times before, four-fifths of the Bible is law. Or the word we use for it is prophecy. Four-fifths of the Bible is prophecy. All prophecy is hinged to the law one way or another. That leaves only one-fifth of the scriptures that deal with Paul's message, grace. While all the time in the Old Testament, the word grace is used, many times in the Old Testament it is used, but it is never, never used in the sense that it was pure. Translation from the Hebrew for the word grace most of the time in the Old Testament is mercy. 
God having mercy on somebody and God giving grace to somebody are two different things. Amen. Two different things. It isn't mercy we need as much as His grace that makes us somebody. Not just somebody <coughs> who forgives us. Well, there are a lot of changes that come to a believer when he gets into grace. Let's read about one from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, where I had you turn. In the 15th chapter, let's look at the 10th verse. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now he gives several answers to grace in this one verse of scripture. Let's look at some of them. He first says, by the grace of God I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I never hear Paul talk like this, but what I'm reminded of what he had to say in Philippians chapter 3, where he listed off seven or eight things that had happened to him in his life that made him great. Tribe of Benjamin, uh, Pharisee, uh, come behind in no spiritual gift or understanding. He listed off all the things he was great at, education, family, everything. But he said, I suffered the loss of all these things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. All that's in the third chapter of Philippians. But what really happened to him was he exchanged law for grace. When he saw that the grace of God was greater than law, he made voluntarily the change in his understanding and said, I will suffer the loss of all these things that make me who I am for the grace of God. And so he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, have you ever considered that? Have you ever considered that by the grace of God, you are who you are? Let's go a step further. Without the grace of God, I don't believe any human being knows who he is. You see, they don't know who they are. That's, that's a hard thing to say. And of course, anybody uh, can differ with me on that. But I've got to tell you that I don't believe anybody knows who they are aside from the grace of God. Amen. Why? Because God alone, through the rebirthing, Christ in you, has fulfilled his purpose in your creation. See, I always keep coming back to that. Only Christ in you fulfills the purpose of your creation. So if you don't see the grace of God in that, you'll never become who you're supposed to be. And I get off on that subject a lot of different ways, different times, because I think that most humans are going to live and die and never know who they are. They'll never know. They'll never achieve what they could have achieved in life. I've had a lot of people in counseling. And somewhere along the way, we come on this particular strain in their thinking. And that is, well, you know, I could have done better. I, I could have had a better life. I could have worked out things much simpler way back then. And we go into the detail maybe of what that situation or, or so-and-so was. And what they're telling me is, if I had known who I was, I could have been much further along. So what happens to the average human being? They struggle all their earthly life trying to overcome the problems in their own life. See? Trying to overcome the obstacles in their own life. Trying to overcome the choices in their own life. We talk about that every once in a while. Life, earthly life is nothing but living out your choices. Well, if God makes us live out our choices, his whole hope is that we'll come to see who we are aside from those choices. Aside from the problems that we have had in our lives. And so the grace of God always stands before us as an important factor 
that it is only by His grace that we were given His Son. By grace are you saved. That not of yourself, it is the grace of God that saves you. What does that mean? Grace is what it is that brought the rebirthing. The rebirthing brought the life that fits your creation. Remember, I'm always telling you that God created human beings to have Christ in them from the beginning. The Bible is a book that bears that out in many different ways. So the Apostle Paul says, <clears throat> I have found out who I am. I am who I am by the grace of God. And then in the next line, he says, His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. This, this rings a very sorrowful note. Because most believers born again are going to live and die and never know the fullness of grace. Never going to know it. The Apostle Paul could see that in his day. And so he said, the grace that was bestowed upon me was not in vain. I recognized it. He had a point of, recogn of recognizing the grace of God. On the road to Damascus, he was out destroying followers of Jesus Christ. He had already put some in jail and probably some of them had been killed. He was somebody who would, could brag and boast about his education. He had the highest education, formal education of anybody in the Bible. He could talk about that he was born just right as a Jew. As a Judaistic believer, he was trained right. He was a rabbi. He was a lawyer. He could, he could think of himself in all of these ways. But now he says, when the grace of God came to me, it was not in vain. Now this is a, this is a ticklish point here. This is something people don't want to recognize or understand. For instance, not too many people want to do what Paul did in Philippians 3, turn loose of everything he was to become a new person by Christ in him. That's why a lot of people don't like the Christ life. See, they don't want to give up what they were to become what Christ is through them. Because you see, the way God created them was not for them to become bigger and better <coughs> businessmen because they got education but to become bigger and better businessmen because Christ in them uses that part of their creation for His glory. You have to understand that, to understand what a Christian is. And I have to say again, always remember, a Christian is not a religious person. Christianity is not a religion. Get that in your mind. I'll never present again Christianity as another religion. And I'll always grimace when somebody says they're Buddhist and Shintoist and Jews and Islamic people and Christians. They all need to get together. No, all of them need to become Christians because Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a way of living under the creative plan of God. Amen. And when in our world today, they're denying God the, the right to be a creator. You know what that's doing? That's only sinking humanity down lower into sin and shame. Mm -hmm. Look what's happened in our own generation. Guess your generation. I can remember back in 1960 when for the first time <clears throat> we had things happening that, that growing up in a Christian home I had never faced before. We had homosexuals. We had drug addicts. We had all sorts of... Uh, abusive people turned loose in the world and all of them started singing Christian songs and all of them was doing good things like the, 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 the immorality that broke loose in the 60s. The, the Jesus people and all such as. I'd never been raised like that. I didn't know anything about that. I've had to learn all that but because I could see now that people were attempting to use religion to be who they were supposed to be. And you can't do that. I remember when I was in the Baptist church, I heard an old man testify one time. And he said, my grandpa was a Baptist and my papa was a Baptist. And I'm a Baptist and all my children are going to be Baptist till we die. Well, he had pretty well centered himself in a religious 
identification. That's who he was. But in Christianity, you have no... Christianity doesn't allow you to be Baptist or Methodist or anything else. Some Baptists and Methodists could be Christians, but being a Baptist and a Methodist doesn't make you a Christian. The grace of God is what it is that fixes us in the plan of God. If he brings the sun up every morning, then he has a right to take these people who are created in his image and likeness and put sin out of them and Christ in them. And that's exactly what he's done. That is the grace of God. That's what he's done. Well, I made notes here that I want to talk about. The, the importance of moving out of law into grace. The change that comes with grace. If we went on in this 10th verse, we would see that Paul making his <coughs> declaration that Christ was his life, and that's all he wanted to know was Christ, was able to go on and say, as a result, I have labored more abundantly. Look at that, how he said it. But I labored more abundantly than they all. <coughs> what happens to people when somebody like me starts talking to them about the grace of God? How that we're saved by grace and not our works. The first thing they think of is, is an old statement we had in the Baptist church. Uh, saved by grace and grace alone. That... Uh, it is irretrievable grace as far as God is concerned. But note, when you see the grace of God working in your life, the same thing will happen to you that happened to Paul in this line. I labored more abundantly than you all. You know how the world is going to be reached by Christ's people? Because of the grace of God that's in them. They'll be ready to lay their life down to get this gospel out. They'll go to any ends to please the Lord whom they, they love more than themselves. So he said, grace didn't me, cause me to raise up a lot of people who talked about grace and didn't live the Christian life. He said, actually, what grace did was to cause me to more to labor more abundantly than they all. You understand the difference there? Some people say, well, people got grace, going to live in sin. They can just get by with anything. Once saved, always saved. If they're recipients of grace, if they have been rebirthed with Christ in them, they're going to labor abundantly more than they all. How is it you'll know that Christ lives in you? You'll have that never stop, never cease spirit burning in you that I must share with somebody about what my Father has done in me. You'll labor more abundantly. Otherwise, under the law, we've got to fire you up. We've got to make you feel like you've been to church. A lady said... Uh, she was questioned about television show she was on and they said how'd you like it she said I have to get fired up like this every once in a while what's the difference between law and grace you don't ever need to get fired up I don't have to get fired up that I'm my father's son I don't have to get fired up that my mama birthed me see I don't have to that's just a common, ordinary thing to me. And that's what grace does to you. It fixes you so that it is common, ordinary for Christ to be living in you. For you to have another life. It's not something you run around with a sign on your back. It's not something you have to holler every time you holler. It's something that is so real to you that you're just spontaneous in it. Spontaneous. So I see in this 10th verse... The Apostle Paul said, I labored more abundantly than you all, yet it wasn't I. Oh, that's how you know it's real. When you get to the place that it's not your ministry, your life, your work, your anything, but it's Christ alive in me, that's when grace begins to work. 
That's when grace begins to work. So he said, yet not I. Can you remember another time he said those same three words, yet not I? You remember where it was? Sure you do. It's Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. He's kind of given to that phrase. Isn't that a good one? Maybe you ought to be given to a phrase like that. Now I'd take that one if I was you. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. The grace of God was with him. Well, how does this work in our life? What does this do in our life? I wrote down several points here. Might not get to all of them, but I want to talk about some of these things that just came to me. When you move from law to grace, you're going to have a number of unbelievable changes to take place in your life. Because it's another life, not your life anymore, not I. Yet not I, yet not I, it's another life altogether. And so you're going to have some changes take place. One radical change that will take place in your life is your prayer life. Your prayer life. We say that prayer changes everything, and the more you pray, the more you'll get from God. And that's true. There are two kinds of prayer presented to us in the Scripture. Jesus presented the kind of prayer where uh, you go into a closet, shut the door, and you have an intercession with God. That's good. There are times you will do that. But those are just certain times. That's not life. In the Christ life, you come to a place to where your praying has radically changed because the Christ in you flowing out of you has fixed it so that you are never in a non-prayer situation. Now you need to write that down. When grace takes hold in your life, you're never in a non-prayer situation. Now how many times have we said, oh, I'm just not praying enough. I wouldn't have all this trouble if I was seeking God. I wouldn't have all this trouble if I was praying daily. Well, you probably need to go in the closet and shut the door like Jesus said. But listen to what Paul says. He said in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. We pray without ceasing. How did Paul ever come to this? I read that over lots of times and I said, oh, that's just words. He's a wordy fellow anyhow. And here he's just saying, uh, praying without ceasing means you never stop. And then one day the Holy Spirit showed me something. He said, if Christ lives in you and you've given him a tongue and you've given him a mind, then every word you say is a Christ word. You have no mind and tongue of your own. And it doesn't matter what kind of business you're doing, whether you're buying eggs at the supermarket or or you're getting gasoline at the gas station, or you're talking to your neighbor over the back fence. It doesn't matter what the talk is. A Christian has words that are like a prayer. He doesn't separate his words from being as if he were talking to God or was in front of God, his Father, talking to somebody else. Your prayer life changes. I call that God talk. You see, we've all got little departments in our life. We've got a department for getting mad. The Lord has nothing to do with that. We've got a department for cussing somebody out. The Lord doesn't have anything to do with that. We have a, a department where we have to straighten out somebody all the time. We've got all these little departments that we slip into and say, well, this has nothing to do with the other. Somebody's got to do this kind of work. So what do you do? You leave your God talk and you go back to your old man talk. See, he's dead. But you've got a brilliant memory and when you get mad at somebody, you can level right at him the same old man language you always had before Christ. So what happens to you? In grace, <clears throat> you move out of thinking that prayer is just a special time you talk to God and start remembering that every word I speak has to do with my Father. 
I am not in any separated state from him at any time. See the difference? Try it. It'll, it'll, it'll clean up your life considerably. Get you out of all those other departments. Stop you from having a prayer, prayer confession every time you do it. But trying to remember who you are in Christ. The grace of God will allow you to have a tongue that is always at use for God. A fellow said to me that they said, well, I was in a hard place in the business and we were having a discussion about it. And then he said, the Lord laid something on my heart. What bothered me about that statement was, and, and thankful God laid something on his heart, but what was important, his very words up until that moment should have been God talk, the way a godly person talks. So when you move from law to grace, you're moving into a relationship with everybody you come to that brands you as a Christ person, a Christian. That's what a Christian is. Number two, when you move from law to grace, you begin to find out who you are. You'll find out who you are. If the true gospel is preached where you are, you'll find out what a Christian is. Christian is somebody who has a new father who has birthed in them a new life, everlasting life, eternal life. That's what a Christian is. Christian is not just somebody that goes to church regularly or prays some every day and reads his Bible every day. A lot of people do that who are not Christians. In fact, uh, Islamic people pray a whole lot more than the average Christian does if they go by rote because they, they've got... Uh, I don't know, five times a day they're supposed to pray. Somebody said it was five times a day they had to, had to pray. And I remember it, when we had our Bible school in the Philippines, right across the street was, a, was an Islamic building. And right during the times I was there and spoke, <clears throat> the, the bell would ring. And I tell you, uh, Islamic people come from everywhere and they'd fall down on their face and go through that motion. And uh, it made me think, that, that kind of prayer is what people think they ought to do. No, prayer has to be something that comes from God's gift of grace in your life. You're never in a separated state. Point number two is, when you move from law to grace, you're going to find out who you are. Who are you? Islamic people, when they prayed, knew who they were. They knew who they were. Sometimes when we pray, we sort of bellyache or we grumble or we gripe or we say, oh God, when are you going to do something? God, Aunt Susie's in a bad, bad shape. When are you going to heal her? Uh, sometimes we forget who we are, that he's father and we're offsprings of his. I am a Christian. Heard a fellow talking the other day and he's making a big point out of the fact I am a committed Christian. And it didn't, didn't set right with me. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, there's no such thing as a committed Christian. They're birth Christians, but they're not just committed to be a Christian. They're Christian because they're rebirthed. See the difference? Well, he was still under law. And in law, commitment is a very big thing. In fact, the more committed you are, <coughs> the more you're loved under the law. But it's only when you come to see grace that you find out who you are. You don't want to live life without finding out who you are. You don't want to live life like that. I think I've had one of the greatest blessings I've had in a long time over the death of one of our people in our fellowship. We had a dear man named Warren Redden, who died uh, a couple of nights ago. We've been expecting his death for many months. But when he died, I had the greatest assurance that here is a man who knew who he was. 
Because when he had a revelation that Christ lived in him, he had certain sparks that flew into his mind that set him afire. Things like I knew many years ago when I accepted Christ as my Savior that there was a whole lot more to it than I was understanding. And he said my whole Christian life, I had certain feelings at times that things were going on in my life that I had no words for. And then he said, when I heard this message that Christ lived in me, he said, for the first time I realized who I was. That all of those times was a pushing of the Holy Spirit to bring me to a place to where I know and understand who I was in Christ Jesus. He died. I'm going to preach his funeral this next week. And you know, I have the greatest assurance that he is one who came to this message who died in it, full-fledged, whole, wholeheartedly. For to him it didn't matter whether he lived or died. He knew who he was. It's a shame that you live as long as he did and didn't find that out. But the shame is on those who preach the gospel. Those he listened to never preached the truth the whole truth to him. And so he didn't know. Our responsibility and the responsibility of those of you who want to work in the Lord's harvest field is to preach an honest gospel, to preach a true gospel so that people have something that matches Paul saying it don't matter whether you live or die. See, don't matter. And this man, Warren Redden, was like that. He knew who he was. He sat right here a few weeks ago, talked to Robbie and I. He was on his way to Houston to the cancer clinic. And he said, you know, I don't really want to go there, but he said family wants me to go and find out for sure what's wrong with me. Of course, they, they told him there was no hope for him. Sure enough, God had fixed that already. There was no hope for him. But he sat right there and said, I just want you to know I have lived for the first time since I knew Christ lived in me. What did he have? He had a conjunction between who he was and who God made him to be in the beginning. Only when you come to grace can you come to that sort of understanding about yourself. Point number three, when you move from law to grace, you're going to lose your vir virtuous living. You're going to lose your morality. Because in Christ, all of your virtues are Christ virtues. They're never yours. Somebody said to me that I said, well, my mama had a real sweet kind of love. And I've always prayed that I'd have that kind of love. And I thought when this lady said that, she doesn't even know the kind of love that belongs to her. She probably never will have her mother's love because that isn't what fits her. What fits her is what Christ working through her creation, loves. See? Your virtues are Christ's virtues. I get rebuked every once in a while whenever I read the portion of Scripture that talks about fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, so forth. I always say that's Christ's virtues. Oh, no, somebody said, that's the, that's the Holy Spirit. No, I say the Holy Spirit doesn't give life. He doesn't give his virtues. Those are Christ's virtues. He's the life. It flows out of him. But what we've always called the fruit of the Spirit is contrary to anything taught in the Scriptures. When Jesus got to talking one day about fruit, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. 
It also says in that portion of Scripture that he is the one who, who produces the fruit. Then what does a believer do? They merely bear it. They merely hold it. Like a peach is held on the vine. The vine produced the peach. The peach is the vine product. The limb just holds it. And all you and I are are limbs. Isn't that good news? I don't have to produce fruit. But if there's any produced, I'd like to hold it and be there to get it to somebody so they could come and pick it off my branch. Amen? Amen. So, the virtues are His. Why? It's His love. These are His words in this book. This church, this body of Christ is His body. It's really all Him. What we're having a problem doing is separating ourselves from having built this building and having brought all these people together and having gotten them all saved, trying to get them from that point to the point that I did nothing, but not I. See, but not I. Back to that same point once again. Point number four. I am a container. It is my joy to be a container. God made all the pots differently except they had two important things that was given in every pot he created. Every human is a pot. We hold in these vessels, these pots, these carnal pots, this treasure. But he put two things in every pot he created that fits him, his image and his likeness. Now that don't mean we all look like God or that we are gods in any respect. But it means that we are made as containers that have this touch of God on us in His likeness and image. I'm just a container. Paul was just a container. I can do nothing of myself. Jesus was just a container. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. I do only what I see my Father do. So in grace, we enter into a blessed relationship to where we are nothing and He's everything. Now we have prideful, egotistical people that don't want that to happen to them. They don't want to end up as nothing themselves. If you search Paul's epistles carefully, you would find seven times that he said, I am nothing. Isn't that interesting? Seven times. I am nothing. Not many people want to give up that. There are not many people who want to be godly. They'd like for everybody to think they were godly, but they don't want to be godly with Christ in them. Because they haven't reached that place to where I'll give up everything that makes me who I am. And I'll consider my container as somebody that holds Christ, which is more important than anything I have ever had in this container before. It'll be more important than anything that I've ever had in this container. Paul was a container, Jesus was a container. And you're a container. Your life can either be full of all the junk that's in the world. I hear Paul saying that the things of the world pass away. Only that which is of Christ continues. Be not taken up, he would say in another place. Be not taken up with the things of the world. But be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what Christianity is all about. You say, well, that means we're just going to have a whole lot of people look like God and act like God and think like God. That's right. What does this world need? It needs Jesus. But if we are not the people that 
are godly, the people that the world can look at and say, that's what I want, we're going to have a hard time reaching this world. We're already a billion, I heard this just last week, we're already a billion, four hundred million behind in reaching Islam. That's a big number of people, you know it. How are you going to reach them? They don't see Jesus. Maybe. Most will not. But you and I that have Christ in us have the grace of God given to us to exemplify Jesus. I've been delivered from the law and I've entered into grace. And another thing it's done for me is that I have no longer any rights to live by the memories of my old life. I don't live by the memories of my old life anymore. That's the old man got killed. Remember, that's what was wrong with the woman in Romans 7. She kept thinking about her first husband that died and her new husband, which was parallel being Christ. She didn't think about it like she did her old husband. No wonder under the law she had such a horrible life. We don't live with the memories of the past anymore. Why? Because in Christ I have no past. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that you don't have any past before God anymore? The blood has cleansed you, washed it all away, but almost everybody I deal with is wrestling with their past. They're wrestling with their past. I never had anybody in counseling that didn't have a past problem that was bigger than any present problem. They're wrestling with things that have happened, things that have taken place. They didn't start a new life. They're not new creations. They are saved people trying to straighten out their old life. And that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. We are never to try to straighten out our old life. Well, we've had a lot said about that, haven't we? I remember I used to preach when I was an evangelist that uh, you need to go back and make everything right. Uh, you need to go and confess to everybody you've been lying to and whatever. That fit the law, but it doesn't fit grace. Because what it is you were is dead to God. It's dead to God. He's not interested in you making it up all right. What he is interested in is letting Christ come through you now. Let Christ be your life now. But because we didn't get started out like that, we have Christian people that are spending all their time trying to straighten out the past. The law will help you there. If you, if you robbed and stole and took something you shouldn't have, or you hurt, killed somebody or whatever, the law will get you sooner or later. And coming to Christ... We'll send you to the law. That's, that's the outer law. I'm not talking about that. Somebody says, well, do I not take, obey the law in anything? Yeah, the outer law, but not this inner law that says I have to do this to be who I am. You see the difference between the two? Parents come to me and say, well, I've got to lay the law down to my kids. That's good. That's the outer law until they are converted and know about an inner law that keeps you for being who you are in Christ. So I think I'll quit with that. That was my number six. When you move from law to grace, you never look for Christ again outside of you. Never look for Christ again outside of you. You wish sometimes you could see Jesus in somebody else. We sing our little song, I see Jesus in you. And that's a wishful thought. And I hope I do see Jesus in you. If, you, if you've confessed that he's your Savior, I, I see Christ in you. 
I'd like to see him in all your actions, ways, but we can wait on that. May take the resurrection morning for some of you to come to that. <laughs> and I hope to be there on the resurrection morning too. I hope to see you at that time. But we no longer look for Christ outside of ourselves. Now I see my Father outside of Christ. I see my Father outside of the Christ that lives in me. You understand the difference there? I pray to my Father because He's outside of me. But I'm in a love affair with the Christ that lives in me. Christ in me is my hope. He's my hope. Christ in me is my life. That's what I am. Him. Christ in me is my healer. Whatever I need to have healed, whatever I'm suffering from, whatever problem I'm in, He's inside of me. What He needs is for me to give up to Him, to stop being selfish and say, Jesus, it's all yours. It's up to you. All up to you. Try it. Try it. I have many more things to say, but uh, the Lord has helped me greatly to get this far. I didn't think yesterday I'd be able to talk, and I didn't talk very good today, but uh, I don't know what good talk is, so I did the best I could. I've had a real croup in my throat. But you've been patient to listen to me. God love every one of you. I love every one of you, and this is a great day in the Lord. Amen. We're learning. We're learning. His grace is sufficient. And Paul started us off by saying, I am what I am by the grace of God. Not my education, not my past, not my money. I am what I am by the grace of God. Get it fixed in you. You'll be glad that you did. Well, we're going to come to a close now. This is about the best group of people I've ever seen anytime, anywhere. God love you. So reach over and take your neighbor by the hand, will you? Reach over and take your neighbor by the hand. We're going to sing our little song here. I, I told the Lord I wouldn't have any more benedictions when I came into the Christ life. So all we do is just sing this little song here. We sing this. Are you going to sing with me? Oh, boy, look at who I got here to sing with me today. Where's my, my wife? Hey Amen. I'm glad you woke up. This is a good thing. Look at your neighbor and say, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you because I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me. In my life and all that I do. I see Jesus in me. That's it. Hug every neck you can till we meet together again. God love you.